In this video, I get together for a conversation with my good friend Nathan Childers backstage at the Birdland Jazz Club in New York City. For over 10 years, Nathan has been the lead alto player in the Birdland big band, and at the same time, he's led the life of a very busy professional saxophone player in New York. In our conversation, we talk about the survival skills necessary to make it as a professional sax player. Nathan gives us his tips for success on reading gigs, and he also tells us about the mouthpieces and reeds he uses on all the different horns. I have to say, I was really surprised when I heard his setup. We also discuss the difficulties involved in switching between the different saxophones, alto, tenor, soprano, and baritone. Thanks, Nathan, for your insights and for giving us a peek inside the life of a working musician in New York. Music is meant to be produced, performed, engaged with. I think all of us know that when you go to a concert, You've got the lighting, you've got the smell, you've got the, the feel of the room, you've got the texture of the music in the room. That's all different than on a recording. I love watching different performers in any context because I like to see, I like to put together what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. And in some cases, these are the, the certain performers make it look literally easy. Um, and then there's those other performers that I also love just the same, where they're not making it look easy, but they're working. They're really physically working, and I also love to see that. I actually sometimes get a little more out of that than, than the person that makes it look easy. To me, when you're talking about jazz specifically, it's a very active music. It's, it's essentially its own kind of combat sport in a nice way. supposed to take risks so not always but when I see that person with a trickle of sweat and that grit often they're taking a risk I don't think I make it look easy necessarily I'd like to think that I take risks the players that I've always liked the most for myself are the musicians whether it be on a recording or live where they'll do something and I'll literally sort of lean back in my chair like oh okay you know that went a different way and clearly and I also am okay with it, with whether that idea that they tried didn't work. I'm cool with that. I don't think anyone should read in too much to the body language of players. I mean, I went to a concert when I was in college and I saw Michael Brecker play, and what was coming out of the end of his horn versus his body language did not line up whatsoever. It was like unbelievable musicianship, and he was just still. The classic working musician, which is which is a great thing. It's what I am. It's, it's, it's yeah. the guy who's out playing gigs. So the range might be working with a singer. It might be a solo saxophone gig. It might be a quartet and up from there to a big band like tonight. Um, it could be a little bit on the classical side, typically more on the jazz side. It could be pop rock. could be Broadway. could be off-Broadway. could be what around here we call a club date, which is could be at a club or it could be a corporate type gig. Um, around you know this region, pretty much anywhere in the U.S., you have to do lots of stuff, and uh, that's great. for me. That's great. I actually enjoy it, and that means playing different instruments. Um, when people ask me which horn do I play, are you an alto player? I just say sure. I, I get hired for tenor gigs, alto gigs, play a fair amount of soprano, occasionally baritone, flute, clarinet. I do use my piano skills from when I was younger constantly when it comes to teaching. L lately a lot of it is simple long tones um, because if it, my schedule is really pretty pretty hectic. Um, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Long tones, articulation exercises, uh, sort of the basics. Uh, that, that's the most helpful. Scales, 
major, minor, chromatic, just to get the fingers moving. Um, that stuff stays with you for the for your entire you know time. Um, so if you don't have a lot of, I tell my students, if you don't have a lot of time, put in five minutes on your long tones or something articulation oriented to build your embouchure and to get some basic structural habits going. That's going to serve you better than a lot of other types of things that you might do. A lot of my gigs require intense sight reading skills, which I used to practice a lot. I would just practice sight reading every day to because I knew that I needed to be a great sight reader here, which is true every single day. I did something recently with a great band, Charlie Colello, if you look up that name, killer, just amazing arranger. And we played down the charts, and you play it once, and there might be a couple little things, and without anything said, that second time through needs to be correct. Okay, so I'll tell you, when I was in college, uh, I was put in my place pretty quickly. Uh, I, did, I auditioned, and here's what put me at the last spot of the last band as a freshman. My sight reading was terrible. So over my freshman and sophomore year, I worked very hard on sight reading. By the time I was in grad school, you could throw most things in front of me, and, and I was going to be able to, to play it. I tell all students the following. If you're in an ensemble, all ensembles rehearse in a similar way. They might hand you a new piece of music or it's already on your stand. I tell students those precious few seconds are critical for you to study that music. Um, what's the key signature? How fast is this? What's the time signature? What, okay, there's an accidental there. So I try to train my students in, I mean, in split seconds to get a sort of graphic sense of this piece. Where's the highest note? Where's the lowest note? Where is this? Where does it end? Oh, there's a solo. So that's what I do and it happens in seconds. Um, so I do a, a, a very quick scan of the piece, a sort of compositional scan. That's huge. If I don't do that, I'm, I'm, I'm walking into the unknown. If I do that, uh, my success rate goes much higher. In the last several years, I've been uh, got connected with what I, what I consider a truly brilliant mouthpiece refacer, this, this guy, uh, Brian Powell, and we've kind of worked on certain mouthpieces. Um, I've been going through a Brillhart phase, if you want to call it. So I've collected some Brillharts on, on alto and tenor, and I found this interesting Brillhart, which I believe is w one of the later, if not the latest model that he made before he passed away. And it's resin slash plastic, and it's pretty pretty gutsy, bright. I had Brian work work on it. That's what I've been playing for a couple of years on certain types, of, like lead alto scenarios and maybe louder type gigs. Um, if it's a trio gig and I'm playing alto, I have a really unique uh, Selmer short sing from let's say the 50s. It was worked on by a classical refacer, Bob Scott, many years ago. Um, and it plays great, but it's got a more woody, timbral kind of different vibe to it. That's what I was playing tonight, which can work. You just have to work a little harder to get the projection. Um, so I'm pretty particular with mouthpieces and reeds. Soprano, I've been playing, I have tons of mouthpieces, but I've, I've been playing a, a Barry 64. It's a modern mouthpiece maker with a very hard reed and um, it works. It's not easy on the chops, but it works. I've always played a three and a half Hemke Alto, but I, it's like being in between pant sizes, so I use a reed clipper. So I, I, I don't know how to explain it. If I play a four, it doesn't play the same. But if I play a three and a half and I clip it twice, it plays right for me. I don't know. Uh, soprano, I play like a four soft. And I might clip that too. So it's a very, pretty aggressive read. Um, for me, pitch on soprano, you need a hard read. For me. Tenor, I've developed into the opposite where I'm playing a pretty, pretty open. A 125 opening like a nine star link. Um, also with pretty hard reads, like um, a Lovaz medium hard to hard. So that's pretty hard setup. And baritone is a nine star as well. Let's call that a 125, 130, with like the hardest read I can get, like a Lovaz hard clip twice. Wow. So yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty like, uh, that's, that's yeah, yeah. But um, I, I don't feel like I'm, for me, it's not like I'm like overly working. I am working, but again, it goes back to the players that I like. I like that fight. 
took me years to get a tenor amateur. Years, like I mean, like ten years. Like it took me forever because of the way I play. I have a good amateur for soprano and, and alto, meaning it's it's catered nicely to that. Tenor was was a real tricky thing for me to 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 loosen up and get more of this kind of thing going on. It took me a long time to loosen the jaw, loosen the bottom lip up, and let the voicing of the tenor happen. One of the biggest mistakes you can make on these instruments is to try to play them like the other one. If I try to play the tenor at all like an alto, it's not going to work. So now when I pick up each horn, I let go as best I can. I let go of those other instruments. People fall into the mistake that just because the C is the same fingering that it's a saxophone, but, but you're, you're going to sound off. You're not going to sound right if you're going at it that way. You, you got to let it be what it is. I've discovered that not only is my setup not like my alto sound, uh, setup, but my sound is even like my, it's a different thing. Here in New York City, there's no time or money to rehearse. Everyone's got to get really focused on their skill set.